So here I'm going to complete the time series data lecture. As I said in the lecture, I will briefly review this at the beginning of next week's lecture. Uh, but so you can tackle some exercises. Yeah, here we go. We start from slide 37 and continue to the end of the time series data lecture. So we've introduced um, all important aspects of armor models. Now I want to show you, and we developed these armor models for stationary process. We said really we want to apply these to stationary data. Now we come to the issue of how do we actually test for stationarity. As with a number of other things, I'll have to say that the, the full beauty of this will only be covered in applied macroeconometrics. But here I do want to give you the idea because it should be quite easy to grasp from what we've already done. So the test which is going to be used to, to test for stationarity or to test if a series is stationary or not is what's called the Dickey Fuller test, or more usually the ADF, the augmented Dickey Fuller test. Now let's start from an example from an AR2 model. Here we have two coefficients. I neglected the constant, that's not crucial importance at this stage. Okay. I have two coefficients, and you can see that of course. 0.8 plus 0.2 is equal to 1. So the sum of these coefficients, here we have 2, is equal to 1. That was, of course, the condition we said must not happen because that represents a non stationary series. So we are now looking at a non stationary process. Now, what I first want to show you is that whenever this condition is met, not only for this particular case, we, which we just stated, but whenever it is met, we'll be able to transform our ARP process, so more generically, ARP process, into this form. Now, what are the important elements here? Important elements are, are the characteristics of this form. It's also called the Dickey Fuller regression or augmented Dickey Fuller regression is that the dependent variable is the change in yt that we have as one explanatory variable yt minus 1, so the level, not the change, the level, but one period lagged compared to the dependent variable. And then we have uh, lagged values of dyt minus 1 or lag values of delta yt, so delta yt minus 1, yt minus 2, up to lag p. So this almost, this is approximately equal to an ARP process, not for yt, but for delta yt. The one difference being this term here, okay? This is the term which you would not see here, so it's that one plus this term. So firstly, I want to demonstrate that this works for this particular case. So, so here's the next lecture slide. We'll start out from our process here, or point eight, yt minus one plus or point two, yt minus two. The first thing is we do is we subtract yt minus 1. Why? Because on the left-hand side, what we want to end up with is this term, delta yt. And the definition of the change is, of course, the current value minus the previous value. Okay, so we'll just subtract yt minus 1, and that will fix the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, of course, what we have here is 0 0.8 times yt minus 1 minus yt minus 1. That delivers negative 0 0.2 yt minus 1 and everything else will remain unchanged. So here we have this bit plus this bit will deliver this bit. Everything else is unchanged. So now we do a little trick, a trick which often is very useful. We add and subtract the same term. So we don't change anything on either side of the equation, but just we add and subtract something here on the right-hand side of the equation. But since we add and subtract, we are actually not changing the equation. So what we'll do is we add and subtract 0.2 yt minus 1. So what we have here, that yt, let me do a little bit of accounting. So the blue bit here, negative 0.2 yt minus 1 is this. Then we have plus 
0.2 t minus 2 from the previous line that ends up back here. We have the error term that ends up here as well. But we have this plus minus 0.2 times y t minus 1 here. So why do we do this? What have we achieved? And then we'll ask, once we see that, we'll go back and ask why the 0 0.2, okay? Why was it particularly 0 0.2? So firstly, these two things here, you know, they cancel out negative 0 0.2 plus 0 0.2 times y t minus one. So they cancel out. But I'll leave the term here, but just at the zero. And I want to leave that term because that is exactly this additional term, this y t minus one term. So these two guys are being taken care of. Then we have negative 0.2 plus uh, times y t minus 1 plus 0 0.2 times y t minus 2. So we can factor out the 0 0.2 or the negative 0 0.2 better. So what we get is negative 0 0.2 and then y t minus 1 minus y t minus 2. So that's what we have here. So if we factor that out, you'll see you get exactly these two, I should actually, these two terms are exactly the same. And then of course, y t minus one minus y t minus two is exactly the same. This guy here is exactly the same as delta y t minus one. So this is now our lab for lab term. All right, so what have we achieved? We have basically transformed our model into, and here on the left hand side, of course, we still have delta y t, nothing has changed. This is now this equation up here. And we only have one lag, you can see both here, so we only have one lag, could, could have been more, uh, delta y t minus one, and that particular coefficient is negative 0.2. So that psi i, psi one is negative 0.2. So, why did we have to subtract negative 0.2 here? Now the crucial bit, like the crucial thing we needed for this was the following. We needed to turn this into a delta yt. So we had yt minus 2 here. To turn that into a delta yt minus 1, we needed to subtract negative 0.2 yt minus 1. So we needed to be able to have the same factor, but such that we can then factor out this factor to leave us with yt minus 1 minus yt minus 2, which turned into that delta. Okay, so it was, where was it? It's this term that was crucial, okay, and we needed that here. Now, to see what we need, sometimes, you know, that requires a little bit of practice, but you need to have in mind what you are after. It was this equation we were after. So we needed to do whatever we needed to do this. Now, I didn't say we needed the 0 0.2, the plus 0 0.2 to can cancel out the yt minus 1 terms, okay? Because that will automatically happen, but only if these two coefficients sum to 1, okay? So only if that coefficient, if that result holds. If that result doesn't hold, we will not get a zero here. So, this coefficient here in front of the y t minus 1, this is now important. I just said this will be 0 whenever, if the process is non-stationary. Or more precisely, let me use different color to see better, better more precisely, it will be zero if the sum of all our AR coefficients is equal to one. Now, if that sum is actually larger to one, which could happen as well, what will we then find? Then we will find A actually larger than zero. That is both of these cases mean that YT is non-stationary. So if my t is non-stationary, we will find that a is either exactly equal to zero in this case, or it's larger than zero in this case. 
So that means in return that the process is stationary if that term A is smaller than zero. Okay, so that's the important information. And now what we're going to do is we're actually going to use this regression 7 when we don't, of course, in practice, we don't know these coefficients, right? We don't know uh, these coefficients, the alpha, nor the a, nor all the size. But what we do is we're going to estimate such a regression and we will test, okay? We will, we will test whether this coefficient turns out to be larger or equal to zero, then yt is non-stationary, or whether it turns out to be smaller than zero, then it is stationary. So let's proceed to the next slide. So now I told you earlier that if we, let me actually just copy this guy here. So here is this uh, equation which we could transform, transform this equation to. So by estimating this equation, I said we perform a hypothesis test. Of, all, of course, in practice, we don't know this coefficient. So in practice, there will be a beta, or let's say a, we called it earlier a, and then we want to perform we want to test the null hypothesis that this a is larger or equal to zero against the alternative that a is smaller than zero. I told you when we're dealing with stationary data, then we can use normal inference in, or at least asymptotically, asymptotically valid inference in autoregressive models. Now, can, that, can we do this? Well, firstly, this guy, think of the GDP example. While GDP itself, if GDP was equal to Y, and then delta Y will be a measure of growth in GDP, then we know while GDP is non-stationary, that growth can very well be stationary. So this guy here could be stationary and all these guys could be stationary. But we still have this yt minus 1, and that's a non-stationary variable, especially under the null hypothesis, okay, yt. I know we want to test whether it's non-stationary, so we don't know, but under the null hypothesis it is. And what about our test distribution? So if we were to perform a t-test, what we would do is we would estimate alpha hat, we would subtract the value from the null hypothesis, that would be zero, divided by the standard error of a hat. Now if we perform this, the question is, what is the distribution of this test statistic? Because we need to know the distribution to be able to perform a hypothesis test. The problem is, under the null hypothesis, these distributions you always need under the null hypothesis. Under the null hypothesis, yt is non-stationary, and therefore our standard inference does not apply, right? because we require stationary data. Anyway, let's assume we didn't realize this. I would just want to show you what would happen if we don't do this, if we didn't realize that there was a problem with inference, if we just used normal t-tests and the normal critical values. What we do is we simulate processes from this equation. Okay, you can do that in MATLAB easily. Um, and we do that 10,000 times. And then we estimate this regression. Now we know this is a non-stationary process. So we should, we are in the case where the null is true. So we would if we perform a hypothesis test at 
at a 5% significance level, we should reject the true null hypothesis in 5% of cases. Okay, so that, that would be a correctly sized test. So if we use our standard inference, we have a one-sided test. So our critical value, remember one-sided but left-tailed test, standard normal has zero, negative 1.645 will cut off 5% of the probability. Okay, so that's the critical value. Reject H0 if the t-stat is smaller than this. So we'll do this now a thousand times with a process where we know the null hypothesis is true. So we told that only in 5% of our 10,000 simulations, so that's 500, we would find a t-test smaller than this. So let's see what actually happens. Next slide, slide 40. So what actually does happen, so as we said before, we would expect 5% rejections. What actually does happen is we get almost 50% rejection. So in a, approximately 50% of cases, we conclude that yt is stationary. Okay, because that is the alternative hypothesis. Although that is incorrect. So that's pretty devastating. Okay, we think we do something half scientific and precise, hypothesis testing, great. I learned that at uni, you apply it to this and you're just wrong. Or at least you're as good as tossing a coin. Now, that's not very good. So what I did here is I actually plotted the empirical distribution of the t-tests. What I have, the red one here, uh, it's not precisely, I just simulated this again. Let's see the red one here. This is approximately a normal, a standard normal distribution. So if our distribution is correct, our actual test statistics should follow this distribution. But what we do in fact get, get is this distribution. Okay, these are our actual t statistics. So it's clearly it has moved to the left. And remember, our critical value was negative 1.645, so it's about here. That was the critical value, and you can see that in this particular case, about half the observations were to the left of this. This is why we get this rejection. So this didn't work. Well, in all fairness, I anticipated that it wouldn't work. The reason being that we have this guy in here, yt minus 1, which under the null hypothesis is non-stationary, and therefore this regression under the null hypothesis will not meet our required assumption. Remember earlier in the lecture we said we need stationary data. So, all is not lost especially not if you will uh, choose applied macroeconometrics. But we need to learn to, yeah, firstly, we need to learn to count. Uh, so two lessons, I have three points here. Um, so firstly, when we do this ADF test, the augmented Dicky Fuller test, we can perhaps use it, but we cannot use our standard normal uh, critical values. Okay, the critical values cannot come from here. And we said why this is the case, because of this baddie here. So what we need, and I think my thought was this, well, this was one point, what we really need is new special critical values. And they come from, predictably, is called the Dickey-Fuller distribution. Okay, And every standard econometrics textbook has a table uh, of these. You can, uh, you can check, I hope, it will be in the hedge, tab in the hedge textbook. Now the second point really, although number three here, is that whenever we have regressions with non-stationary series, we cannot trust our inference. And we've just seen such an example. Okay, and so but the lesson from here is much more generic. Whenever you include a non-stationary series into your regression, the inference you cannot trust. 
So this is, if you take nothing else away from this course, uh, this is what I want you to take away. It's not going to get you through the exam with a pass by itself, uh, but um, it's very important. It's enough to forward a lot of applied regression analysis. So what we've done so far is we just looked at basically univariate models, the AR and the MA and the AMA models. We said we're going to use that for forecasting, just individual model uh, time series. We're going to abstract from all complications. Now, sometimes this is not appropriate. Okay, Sometimes you really want to include in your regression model, time series regression model, you want to include more than just lag dependent variables. So let me just briefly introduce a bit of notation. We have our dependent variable, we still call it yt, a constant, and then we have a vector of explanatory variable, set t, a coefficient, beta. Now that set t, that can now contain, contain all sorts of uh, variables. So we're basically just expanding our horizon a little bit. It can still contain lagged values of yt, of yt, so yt minus 1, yt minus 2, up to yt minus p. In fact, it could also, I could add that here, it could also include lagged error terms. So it could also be an ma bit in here, not a problem. But importantly, what we now want to consider to add is just another variable, xt, a variable that's different to the dependent variable. So if we are still thinking about GDP or perhaps modeling the growth in GDP, we could perhaps think of interest rates, uh, exchange rates, unemployment rates, all sorts of stuff. And that can enter in time t, t minus 1, t minus 2 as well. Okay, so this is the reality that very often you want to expand your armor model, that's the green bit, with some explanatory variables. In fact, um, the, the code which I showed you on the Eclair website with the univariate models. In fact, let me just briefly show you, uh, show you this. Where is my, yeah. So, uh, I just want to show you briefly where on the Eclair website you can find this. You go to uh, special econometric topics, univariate time series. Okay, and in here you can basically see how to estimate AMA models. We use, the most convenient is to use this procedure AMAX filter as part of the MFE toolbox. So, um, that would be something you either put in your folder this is basically, if you go, let me just do it, the, go the full hog. If you follow this link, you get to either that web page, it's possibly best, I wanted to change that. If you then go to the Bitbucket repository where the files are, then here on the right hand side, there's a download button here. You can download this and if you put that into this is a lot of different folders just put that into your matlab folder for instance uh, because the machines at uni you can't uh, you can't change the program folders if you have your own version you can put that into the toolbox folder in your matlab on your program files um, check with me if you have trouble but you can just expand or unpack this folder in matlab so and with this AMAX filter, you can uh, estimate here, for instance, an AR3 model. This one here will be an AMA32 model. And uh, here we'll talk about how to do model identification. You can do that. I'll expand the forecasting code. But importantly, this AMAX function allows you to add other variables as well, Okay, X variables. You have to check the help. Amax filter function. I'll just type help Amax filter and you'll find out how to do that. So here, however, all we, I wanted to really say here is this is perfectly possible, but importantly, all elements of set, both the x's and the y's, of course, have to be stationary. Okay? Otherwise, there's no point testing this model by all this. 
Sometimes you need a different series to achieve stationarity. For instance, in the GDP ca case, okay, GDP is not stationary, but the growth in GDP is. So this is the last but one slide, slide 43. Just as a reminder, what we need formally, basically we had these two terms up already very early in the lecture slides for, to get nice properties, so to get asymptotic normality of our estimated parameters. So to ensure, remember our model is gonna be y equals um, alpha yt alpha plus set t times beta plus epsilon t. So what we require is that the whole matrix set, that would be all the set t's, all the observations stacked above, so this is a, a nice matrix, uh, that this term for large samples n converges to this fixed term. We need stationarity for this and we need that this term set prime epsilon um, is v1. Well. So, and what we need is indeed that the law of large numbers is applicable to this. So this will be a law of large numbers as well. We also need a central limit theorem to apply. And that means that this term here is normally distributed in large samples, asymptotically normally distributed. That together, all these things together, will give beta hat an asymptotic normal distribution. And if that's the case, then we can perform inference, perform inference on beta and beta hat will be unbiased indeed. So that is the importance of using stationary, stationary data. Let me just give you a little bit of an outlook of what exciting stuff uh, is waiting for you. Basically, what happens if you have non-stationary data? Well, we already said uh, often you can difference the series and you get stationary data and so difference the series. And then you get stationary data and you can use standard techniques to do this. However, sometimes differencing loses your information. Okay. And um, the case the, the case where this is particularly important is if you have two non-stationary series but they are related to each other in a very specific uh, specific way. In fact, if there's some sort of equilibrium between these, and then you actually have to deal with non-stationary data. This sort of technique is called co-integration analysis or error correction models, applied macroeconometrics. You will learn about this as so quite exciting area. Another area also dealt with in applied macroeconometrics is dealing with multiple time series. So where situations where you don't you may have, let's say, five different series, but it's not really easy to say which one's the dependent and all other four, are explanat four series are explanatory variables. Sometimes it's desirable to treat all series basically on par, equally potentially or interrelated without being able to single out one as a dependent variable. So here we will often use co-integration analysis will actually deal with this as well, but sometimes we just use vector autoregressive models, VAR models. And lastly, another aspect of non-stationarity is where, remember, one condition of stationarity was that yt, the variance of yt was constant. Okay, so there was no time subscript here, so it was constant. But especially for financial time series, that's not appropriate. And often the variance it actually has really good meaning in finance and has the meaning of risk. And then you really want to model time variation in that. And this is done in financial econometrics. So just short of half an hour, that's what I wanted to say.